And um, yeah, I'm just going to talk about it's funky. You'll 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 see why it's funky in a bit. It's mostly about a very funky place. Um, but really, how how do we view industrial buildings, industrial period buildings now in the 21st century? How have they been viewed as as sort of second by second be users, if you like? There's an awful lot of um, relevance put on the original uses of buildings and what were buildings built for. And certainly when we, we go to dig them up, we are looking at the engine house of the mill or we're looking at the, the main rooms of a, a worker's cottage. We want to know how that building was originally built and used. But actually, if, as is the case with many, many of these industrial period buildings, we look at the history of the building going through, these buildings may only have been demolished 20 years ago and actually have vast amounts of history to look at, as well as just their original purposes. So we're just going to look at that. So the industrial landscape, if you like, um, industrial period buildings, tend to really form a massive part of our townscapes, cityscapes, even villages. Um, you know, there's, there's all sorts of different styles, there's all sorts of different functions, different purposes. But actually, they are everywhere. Nearly everywhere you go, you'll find industrial period buildings. Um, they differ in terms of their states of preservation. Some of them are well looked after, well managed, well maintained. They're a joy to behold. We go into them, we enjoy them, it's wonderful. Some of them, not so much so. You tend to get lots of um, buildings which are, are left to, to go derelict. You get mills particularly, which are, are very much more difficult to try and maintain. There's all sorts of issues with, between ownership and who uses and all, all that sort of stuff. And then you also get a vast array of differing purposes for these buildings. So, broadly speaking, we can probably categorise them into, roughly, four different groups. So we've got housing. Usually, um, certainly in bigger cities, and, and this does focus slightly more on Manchester, which is where I know better, um, but usually we're looking at things like um, workers' housing, we're looking at terrace housing, it's very popular, but then also, particularly in larger cities, places like Manchester, Liverpool, London, Birmingham, Leeds, you tend to get these very nice sort of mill owners houses, so to speak, or these very nice big kind of villas and mansions and that sort of thing. Then we have shops and commercial premises. So these are the sort of things that make up our, our high street, so to speak. Some of them were purpose built, some have since become shops, that sort of thing. We also have massive warehouses, certainly again in, in bigger cities like Manchester, Liverpool, Birmingham, Leeds. Um, we've got massive warehouses, all to do with the, the storage of, of various manufactured products. Um, so there's all that sort of um, buildings going on. Then there are mills, a very, very important part of the industrial period, um, of which there is a vast array of varying preservation states, uh, varying sizes, used for manufacturing various different things. So all very slightly different in their own way. Perhaps even the ones that were used for the same items. Um, they're all that slightly different. And then finally we have these public buildings. So we have things like town halls, like schools and hospitals, um, public baths, all that kind of stuff. So we've got this massive wealth of industrial period buildings that aren't necessarily related to industrialisation, so to speak in terms of the actual direct manufacturing. So just very quickly to sort of have a look through what we have got and the way they're kind of being used and reused as well. We've got housing. So as I say, a great proportion of, of the industrial period housing that we still see standing today, particularly in bigger cities and towns, tend to be the workers' housing. Um, so we're looking at this kind of thing, um, terrace houses, usually, um, as we get into the urban areas, into the cities, there aren't so many of these left. And those that are left tend to have been converted into some sort of retail purposes or commercial purposes. Um, basically, that's because as, as our towns and cities have expanded, we've wanted to spend more time on building fancy new buildings that all look wonderful and marvellous. And actually, these, these houses that were originally part of our kind of, uh, I suppose, the peripherals of our, our towns and cities, have actually become part of the town centres and are needing to be updated. I generally tend to find that these are also the, the smaller ones. Um, so you can just see there's a, there's a definite difference in width of houses between these two. You tend to find, particularly in the urban settings, 
we're looking at houses that are generally <coughs> tended to be built early 19th century, um, slightly bigger, well, late 18th, early 19th century. They're slightly bigger, they're slightly better appointed, slightly better made. The minute that population explosion though, happens within the city, particularly again in Manchester, Salford, Liverpool, we have this vast explosion of population all coming in to work in mills and factories. And actually we start to find that houses are starting to be squeezed to get smaller and smaller and smaller to fit into various spaces. So it's only really with sort of various rounds of legislation that we get slightly better houses being built again. And certainly we do tend to find them slightly bigger, the terraces, when we start moving out into the smaller uh, suburbs round about. And it's these ones really that we tend to see more of today still in use, still being reused. Um, because they are still a, a reasonable way of living. I live in a terrace house, it's quite nice. Um, and these have become our norm. These have, these have shaped the way we think about what a normal house is. A normal house is a two up, two down. It's got two windows and a door. Every child will have a picture of it. And it, it's thanks to these, these mass ways of housing people that were, were thought of by the, the industrialists who built them that actually forms our, our way of thinking about what a house should be. Then we have on the other side of things, we have these larger, nice villas and mansions and that sort of thing. And what we've got here are slightly bigger houses that, again, generally tend to stay in use. Because even though they were for a very select bunch of people when they were first built, they've actually now proved to be actually quite a useful way of housing quite large numbers of people. And certainly, again, in, in the larger cities, these sorts of housing are often, often converted into flats. Um, particularly in university towns, you find a lot of this sort of housing in university towns. So these ways of housing are still fairly relevant. The only problem comes, as I say, is when we get into the sort of the city centres. These are both. This is uh, Hume just on the outskirts of Manchester, um, and this is Encoats in Manchester. And we start to see problems happening as as the towns and cities get more and more modernised in the 50s and 60s. Um, these ways of housing, these kind of industrial buildings, cease to be relevant. They cease to be actually usable in these town centres. So unfortunately, a vast array of this smaller, slightly lower quality housing does tend to have gone. And the only way we can find that is then by excavation. So that's our housing. Then we have shops and commercial buildings. Um, and really, they're quite similar in, in terms of, of, sort of the way they're being used and the way they're being um, kept, I suppose to the way we're looking at housing. And again, they are forming the way we think of as a normal high street should look. They form the way we think a shop should look. A shop should have you know, houses above it, it should have a little shop front and a door. We kind of have that as an ingrained thing within us, that this is how shops look. Um, and for that reason, they are still quite useful, they're still quite relevant. And although there's quite a lot of maintenance and repair goes on in them, they're still actually being used. Um, and still having meaning for people. Then we have, again, in the larger cities and particularly in manufacturing towns, we have big things like warehouses, um, we have all sorts of um, commercial kind of enterprises like that. But again, are still really quite useful because they're so flexible in terms of the size um, and the sorts of things that you can do with them, they carry on being used. They may not necessarily be being used for the original purpose that they were built for, but actually, they're still a re really relevant way of either storing offices or residential buildings. Um, and actually, they really work very well for that sort of thing. So you do tend to get a lot of shops and slightly larger com commercial premises tend to be kept, reused. They go through massive amounts of, of restoration and of remodelling and all that sort of stuff throughout the 20th century. But they still remain a relevant part of the town or a cityscape. The only change comes when you get buildings that are slightly more specific. So I've just used a bank here as, a, as an example. But you tend to get buildings which are slightly more specific. They've got more specific things on the inside. Obviously, banks will have great big safes and that sort of thing. And these are the buildings that seem to suffer in the 20th century, and particularly as part of this vast push for modernisation in the 1950s and 60s. The buildings which are that slightly more specific nature tend to suffer. And really, running costs might be a problem, renovation costs, repair costs, all those sorts of problems might come up. And it's led to this sort of building, generally being the ones sort of, that might go. Um, this is obviously a very ornate version. This is again in Ancoats in Manchester. Um, so 
It all depends really for some of these, these commercial therapies, what kind of uses they can be put to, how flexible they are. And then we have mills. Um, there's, there's quite a lot of work being done, particularly on the mills of Greater Manchester, a very big mill survey that's actually been able to show us what a, an amazing resource a mill is, um, which unfortunately not everybody quite picks up on, sadly. Um, <coughs> but mills, predominantly textile mills, um, very, very important for, for building our bigger cities, very, very important for bringing this massive population into Blake in. If it wasn't for the mills, we wouldn't have the workers' houses. But the mills themselves, again, are very, very interesting places, very flexible, yes, in some cases very specific in the nature of, of the things that are contained within them, but actually, as we found over the 20th century, there is an awful lot more usage you can put a mill to if the manufacturing side is gone. Um, so as part of the, the, well, the Greater Manchester and the West Yorkshire Mill Survey that we've been doing at Salford quite recently, we found a vast array of very, very differing uses that these buildings can still be put to and that still make them relevant to the people who live in the area. So, um, I mean, this is one of the only ones that we found that has retained its original function. It's carried on func functioning as a manufacturer's, um, still owned by the same company, the same family business, but it's definitely a rarity rather than the norm. What we tend to find um, are things like these three at the top here that are completely repurposed. So this first one in Delft has been repurposed into residential flats. So we have a flat here, which is rather nice, you can look out the back. We have Pairman in Stockport. That's been changed into separate units. So we have a range of different retail, leisure, commercial, manufacturers as well, all being kept together within this one great big mill. We even have a climbing wall in an engine house. So if that's not a reflectable reuse of the building, I don't know what is. Um, so all of these, these mills ha actually have a vast amount of potential, but not always is it realised. And it very much depends on the ownership of the mill, it very much depends on the location of the mill. I mean, the protection of mills has become part of planning consideration in Manchester, so they are actually looked after and, and looked at carefully when any development is going on. But by no means is this normal. You know, a lot of places still don't necessarily consider this. You look at a very large mill like this, which is clearly had fires, it's being used for fly fitting, it's generally in a, a dreadful state, and you think, would you really want it? And so actually, this, these sorts of mills are the ones that have ceased to be meaningful to the people who live around them. They just see them now as an eyesore, which is a shame. And then we have public buildings. And public buildings are similar in, in terms of, of their flexibility to mills. So we have things like uh, schools. This is Stockport Sunday School. We have council offices, council buildings, like Sarah Town Hall here. We have hospitals. This is Salford Royal. And then we have, like I mentioned before, things like public bathhouses, uh, public offices, smaller scale offices. And these buildings are, are, again, built for a very specific purpose and built to house something which is, is going to carry on needing to be used, particularly in the, you know, things like schools and hospitals are always going to be very useful and relevant. Unfortunately though, the buildings themselves are not always going to be able to keep up with what our 20th and 21st century needs are. And they very often do go through massive periods of renovation and, and updating. Um, but, as in the case of Salford Royal Hospital for example, we tend to find that actually they are just as good at mills and warehouses for being converted into things like residential and offices um, and that sort of thing. So they still carry on being relevant and they keep their facades and that's one of the most important things about some of these industrial period buildings is they keep their facades, they keep their character and the way they look on the outside. They may be completely gutted on the inside but we still maintain the way our streets and our cities look. Unfortunately though, you do get some that are so very specific as with some of the other commercial buildings that you tend to find, um, that just are not really able to be converted. They're not, people haven't necessarily had the, so the imagination, you might say, to be able to convert them into something meaningful that carries on being useful. And despite the lack of, you know, the, despite the amount of interest by local people, these buildings tend to be the ones that tend to go first. So those are the sort of public buildings, um, the sort of buildings that we're looking at in terms of the industrial period, structures that actually have the meaning for us now in the 21st and 20th century. Um, and the reason I'm looking at these is because we've been concentrating um, with an excavation recently 
on one very specific building. It's actually in Moss Side, which is just on the periphery of Manchester. Um, it's, it's quite a nice industrial period building, very Gothic in its style. Um, it's not too bad, but unfortunately, it had an awful lot of things going on in it, um, which meant that later reasons, the building itself was very good, was very nice. It was a really nice building to be able to preserve, but its later uses is what caused it to um, be demolished. Um, but the other interesting thing about this building is how much it meant to the people that used it. And that's the big thing about industrial period buildings. These sorts of buildings form our, our way of thinking about our towns. They are still very, very, um, there's a lot of them across our towns. And they form the way we kind of, we think about towns, they form the way we think of town looks. And they also form the way we think about what we can do in them. Because we do have these potential for sort of very specific uses, we think of a building as being tied up and associated with the thing that it was used for. Most of the time, usually when we're children or when we're young, and it kind of stays like that in our mind, and that very much happened at the Reno. So we were approached uh, by a lady who said, we wanted to dig this building up. It had been demolished in 1986, um, and it had basically uh, meant an awful lot for the, the mixed race community in Moss Side in Manchester. The building itself, uh, the earliest we know of it is from this photo, when, when it looks certainly, is from this photograph from 1908. It was actually built round about 1905 to replace um, a bus terminus. So there was nothing on the site previously. Um, and it was just your average late Victorian um, shops at the bottom, houses at the top, in order for the people who lived in the shops. Um, very nice, as I say, nicely done, nice architecture. Um, but nothing particularly out of the ordinary, still maintained its, its usefulness. Um, and really, it comes into its own, certainly in terms of the the people who now think of it most and who now kind of are stakeholders in it, you might say. Um, it comes into its own around about the 1950s when the residential above the shops, the shops carried on, but the residential above actually became a seaman's mission for mostly African Caribbean sailors. And so we got quite an influx of sailors from that part of the world, all living together, all starting to sort of find themselves in Manchester, find out what they wanted to do in Manchester. And as is generally the case when you get a lot of sailors together, a lot of drinking and gambling started, um, which is probably not unusual for anybody who knows sailors and port towns and that sort of thing. So we actually found that really the building kind of worked well for that because all of this residential um, area space up here was all very, very open. So it really worked well with, with this new purpose of maybe not necessarily exclusively residential, but actually with sort of bringing other people in to start these little informal gambling and drinking clubs. And as that, that kind of got bigger and better and, and more so, um, one of the, well, several in fact, of the original kind of sailors who lived here started to look at perhaps opening a proper establishment and they wanted to look at actually opening a club so they could really formalise this and stop worrying about it a little bit. Um, so what happened is the building itself started um, as shops, but actually we had a basement club coming through this door, we had an upstairs club coming through this door up here, and we had a pub on the corner, all set up, um, all set up sort of specially for them and the people that they knew. And actually what it became were nightclubs. So the Reno was the basement club. And it really became a really special place for the people who went to it. It was the only place that the people who um, had sort of married into the local population could actually feel at home. It's the only place that the children of those people could actually feel at home, those mixed race children. And all well, children shouldn't be going in nightclubs, judging by the people that came and did the excavation, they were. So it, was, it became, although the building was very important, the basement of the building in its later use became something more than just, oh, it's a lovely building, I remember it from when I was a child. Um, so we wanted to, Linda, who is the lady who put together the whole ex excavation, um, wanted to come in and be able to pick out some very important parts of the Reno Club. Not just for the fact that she wanted to open the Reno up, but she also wanted to be able to give this community who used the building in its late life a voice and a sense of place and a sense of belonging. And so what she wanted to do 
was to concentrate on the bits that really had memories for people. So this is the club as it stands <coughs> after excavation. She's very excited that we still have the chequered floor. We've got a bit of the dance floor in the corner, which was apparently the most important bit. Um, but then we also have areas that really provoked an awful lot of excitement. All the volunteers that took part in the bit were all people who had actually been to the club and who actually had this vested interest in it. Um, and there were little bits that got very, very, got them very, very excited. Not necessarily that archaeologists would get excited about yeah, it's a glazed brick fireplace, Ooh. but no, they remembered it and it was recognisable. The other thing that they were very keen on was this area. This was called the gambling room. So you had your main club where you would go and dance and have a lovely time where all the ladies went, apparently. And then all the men went in the gambling room where there was an open fire and lots of things. And we actually found dice in there, so we know we were in the right place. And it was. It, that was another really emotive thing for, for the people who used to go there to be able to find. And we also had this because you wouldn't be in Moss Side if you didn't have an escape from the police, <laughs> basically. Um, and this was another area that Linda was very, very keen that was opened up and exposed because they can all remember when the police came in the front door, they all made it out the back. And she wanted to be able to show that because that was as much a part of the experience as the dancing and the gambling and the drinking. So the legacy of the Reno is, is a little bit more than just the legacy of a very nice um, Victorian built, very large building, very large um, sort of shop complex with residential. The building itself wasn't really thought about at first by the people who went in the club. They just went in the club because they wanted to see their friends, they wanted to have a drink, have a gamble, have a nice night out. But actually what turned out when we started excavating was the fact that actually some of the bits and pieces that they were finding um, had, had a resonance for them that they didn't even necessarily realise. They noticed bits of the architecture, they remembered bits and pieces of things, and all those bits and pieces of the building itself sparked off memories and actually added to their sense of belonging, their sense of place. And now what we have is a group of the people who used to go in the arena who felt completely marginalised by everyone else they met have actually got this as their kind of spiritual home now and they have run with it. Um, just based on the rediscovery of this building. They've got all sorts of um, exhibitions, they've got films, they've got all sorts of things going on now that really makes them feel like they're important and, and valued. So it gets, gets us on to thinking about what do we do about the preservation, the restoration, and the excavation of these buildings? I don't necessarily have answers to these questions, but they're worth thinking about. Who are the custodians of these buildings? Are they the people who own them? Are they the people who use them? Are they the public, the tenants, the stakeholders, the people who, for those, for those buildings, have a meaning for? Should we really be thinking about just the original use of a building when we start excavating it or preserving it or conserving it or studying it? Or should actually we think of it as a whole, as, as all of the uses that it's been put to throughout its lifetime? And should we really prioritise certain features over others? You know, are we looking specifically for the uh, inserted ranges that get put into a cellar dwelling after legislation in the 1850s? Or should we be looking at the concrete floor that was uh, put in afterwards? So it's just some questions to think of, um, and also just to sort of get you thinking about the way we, we start studying buildings. It's not just about, uh, sorry, it's not just about the way they were originally used and actually these buildings because they are, are in our psyche the whole time as being buildings that we remember from childhood or, or from places that we loved these buildings actually add to our own sense of place and our own sense of the way we feel about ourselves and the way we feel about the people who we know are around us so, thank you.